Welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and today we are speaking with Julie M. Simon. She is the author of The Emotional Eater's Repair Manual, and her latest book is what we're talking about today, When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain, and End Emotional eating. Julie is a licensed psychotherapist and life coach with more than 27 years of experience helping overeaters stop dieting, heal their relationships with themselves and their bodies, lose excess weight and keep it off. And she also has a very popular 12-week emotional eating recovery program. And there's another one of those coming up. Uh, She is at overeatingrecovery.com. Welcome to the show, Julie. Hi, Marie. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being with us today. So I have read your book from beginning to end, and I'm taking a a self-compassion mindfulness course right now. So it was just the perfect pairing. The timing was amazing. And it really is all about rewiring your brain so that we don't start reaching for the cookie jar whenever we have a feeling. Exactly. And, uh, it takes a little time to rewire the brain. We have to we have to have some mindfulness practices that we do to do that. Uh, but the great news is is that the we can rewire the brain. the The brain is uh, plastic or moldable, and um, we can kind of rewire it uh, via the experiences we have uh, throughout life, throughout our adult life. Now you appear. I see your picture. You you look like a, a fairly slender woman, um, have you had your own <laughs> challenges with, with overeating and emotional eating? Yes, I definitely have. And I'm, uh, I'm a 100% fully recovered emotional eater. And I know the road really well. That's how I can take people through it. I spent a good portion of my life stuck in a cycle of overeating comfort foods, gaining weight and dieting, and I was never very good at sticking with diets, uh, would try them for a little while, and then I would lose motivation and I'd feel restricted. And I definitely ate emotionally. I used food to calm and soothe myself. I had difficulty managing unpleasant emotional states like anxiety and sadness and frustration and also overwhelm. Um, I had difficulty reframing negative, critical, self-defeating thoughts and self-doubts, and regulating my nervous system. And so food was a very good way for me to manage all that. It calmed and soothed me. It numbed the pain of unpleasant emotions. And because food is so um, brain-altering and pleasurable, it was a very good distraction. It temporarily filled up an inner emptiness and a restlessness I regularly felt, a sort of spiritual hunger. So it took many years of study, um, visits to healthcare practitioners, and therapy <laughs> for me to understand and resolve all the pieces of the overeating repu- overeating puzzle, if you will, in my own life. And I'm passionate about helping other people uh, do the same, you know, recover and resolve their emotional eating. And that's why I've that's why I designed <clears throat> my 12 week program over 25 years ago. And I wrote the books so that, you know, people all over the world could begin to use uh, the skills, principles, and practices that I teach in my office. Beautiful. So there is a seven-step process uh, where, where we're nurturing. We learn to nurture ourselves and take care of ourselves rather than reaching for external things, whether it's food or checking Facebook all day. Or, or whatever it may be. So do you want to talk a little bit about what that what that is? Yes. Um, before I do, let me just preface that by saying that when we're young, when we're, you know, infants and toddlers and small children, our, when our caregivers tune in to our internal world, we call that attunement. So we receive external attunement. So when our caregivers tune into our internal world, and notice what we're feeling, our emotions, our bodily sensations, they help us regulate, our our caregivers co-regulate with us. So when we are having a tantrum, mommy swoops in and with her voice and her behavior, she comforts and soothes us and helps us regulate our emotions and she attunes to our emotions. This is something that 
many emotional eaters didn't quite have enough of. Uh, they may have had very kind, loving, well-intentioned caregivers, but there perhaps wasn't enough uh, attunement, enough attention, tuning in, soothing, comfort, uh, and nurturance. And so many, I would say the majority of emotional eaters don't really know how to do that for themselves, something called internal attunement. And so the skills I teach in the book, the mindfulness skills, are all about learning how to tune in to your internal world, how to regulate your emotional states, how to regulate your nervous system, how to identify exactly what you're feeling, uh, emotions and bodily sensations, how to identify your needs, how to validate how to uh, validate your emotions and needs, how to bring in and access, develop, and strengthen an inner supportive voice that can help you regulate those states. This is a critical piece of something over the years that I saw emotional eaters were missing. They had a very, most emotional eaters have a very strong inner critic Mm -hmm. uh, that beats them up. Mm -hmm. They have a very strong, what I call inner indulger voice. It's an adult voice that says, yeah, we had a really hard day. Let's go to the drive-thru and get the cheesy burger. Um, But what's missing for most emotional eaters is a voice of what I call the inner nurturer, a kind, soothing, warm, ever helpful, ever hopeful, supportive inner voice. And so what we want to do, and the skills take you through this, is we want to build that voice. We want to wire in that voice. And it takes time to do that, but it's um, very doable. So in the skills that I teach, uh, one of the skills in particular, um, I help people learn how to access that voice and I give phraseology. So I teach you how to, how to use that voice. What, what language does that voice sound like? Because many people just haven't had enough exposure Mm-hmm. to this. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, I definitely want to talk more about the skills and the, and the languaging and how to talk to ourselves. But as you were going over the the missing of the attunement as children, um, I can imagine not everyone listening right now might be an emotional eater, but I think it's fair to say most of humanity is an emotional something. You know, we if we're missing attunement from our childhood, we might reach out for the Facebook or the alcohol or the the busyness, the things that we do to distract ourselves from how we feel when we have five minutes of silence. Yes. And, you know, the reality is, is that no parent is perfect. And so almost every kid, you know, has a little bit of something. And, you know, I talk about this in the book that, you know, 70 plus years ago, You know, we used to be raised in very large families and villages, and we had large extended families, and they were local. You know, you didn't have uh, people living, you know, across the country. Um, You know, you had large village of people. So if your mother or your father happened to be distracted, or maybe they had an illness, or maybe they had some mental health challenges, there was, there were a lot of other people, even in the neighborhood, um, you know, that you could connect with. Today, parents are so challenged. Um, You know, there's a lot of single parents. Um, You know, oftentimes parents are challenged financially, emotionally, they don't have enough support. A neighborhood is no longer a community, you know, so there's a much higher probability now, and especially with um, cell phones and, you know, social media and all that stuff, there's a much higher probability that that kids are not, and latchkey kids, that kids are not getting the kind of emotional nurturance, consistent and sufficient emotional nurturance to wire their brains properly. And so, as you say, they're going to turn to external sources of comfort, soothing, stimulation, and that doesn't have to be food. That can be alcohol, drugs, um, cigarettes, shopping, gambling, you name it. And in fact, many of my emotional eaters, when they are beginning to stop using food, sometimes there's a short period of time where they start using some other source of comfort. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You know, they switch to shopping. You know, they'll say, you know, I'm not eating as much, but I am like overspending like you can't believe. And it's it's the same issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And th- because it's the, the dopamine and the serotonin and that, that feel good, that feeling that we get when we engage in these behaviors that we're really seeking out, right? It's that feeling that we get. And it's also 
again, when we haven't had the consistent and sufficient nurturance in our early years that we really need for the brain to wire in properly, not only do we maybe have deficient brain chemicals like you're saying, but we also have an emotional state where we always want more. We're, we're always feeling like we want more. So we have a slice of chocolate cake and we feel like that's not enough. We want more. Um, you know, we go out and we have some fun with our friends and then we come home and we feel empty. We want more. So something's missing. We're looking for something outside of ourself to, you know, soothe us, comfort us, energize us, um, give us hope, spiritually awaken us. You know, we're always looking a person, place or a thing, something outside of ourselves to do that when actually the source of everything that we're looking for is already inside. We're speaking right now with Julie M. Simon. She's the author of When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain, and End Emotional Eating. You can find her at overeatingrecovery.com. And there is a 12-week emotional eating recovery program that's coming up. Uh, we will talk about it later, but how often do you do these 12-week programs, just quickly? I run them about four to six times a year, Uh just depending, somewhere between three and six times a year, depending on uh, what's going on and, uh, you know, how many people are signing up at any point in time. Perfect. So if someone's listening to a repeat of this, a rebroadcast, they could still probably get in in the next month or two for a new one, maybe. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Julie. You were talking about how most of us now, most parents these days are busy. We live in these these smaller families where there isn't a lot of extra people around to take care of our emotional needs growing up. And that's that's the average experience of a child. That's not even including people who are neglectful or abusive or anything like that. That's just a fairly common average childhood experience these days. Yes, it's so true. I mean, there so many times I'm out in the world, might be a market, might be walking down the street, might even be in a park where I see a parent, you know, holding their kid's hand, uh, you know, while the parent is on the phone. And, you know, I think to myself, and I don't blame the parents. I know I understand why it's happening. It, you know, our time is constrained. You know, we're all kind of in a hurry. We're all under stress you know, get to those emails, call those people back. And so I understand it. On the other hand, I think we all really need to make a pretty big effort, and especially with our children, to take the time to tune in to their emotions, take the time to tune in to their needs. Um, I, I think, you know, this book is, of course, written for emotional eaters, but there's a uh, in the third part of the book, I talk about um, attracting nourishing connections. So if if you haven't had nourishing connections, how would you know how to find them in your life? And then I also talk about nurturing others. And so just weaving that in a little bit right now, it's really critical that parents uh, learn the skills that are in the book because you need to know how to attune to your children well enough. You need to do a good enough job if you want to wire their brains properly so that they don't turn to food or other substances or activities for comfort down the road. So this is a really, these are really critical skills for people to learn after the fact if they didn't get enough of this when they were young. And it's also, these are also critical skills for parents to learn very early uh, with their children. And even I can imagine it, it would improve relation, romantic relationships and friendships because so many times I, I remember an experience, uh, a foster parent, I was upset about something, probably something that the foster parent had said or done to me. Uh, and the, the foster mother said, go have a donut, it'll make you feel better. And I remember it so clearly. And of course, I did have a donut and I ended up not because of that one incident <laughs> becoming overweight because that was how that was the only way that I knew how to take care of myself because there was nothing nobody labeling my emotions nobody teaching me how to take care of myself or giving me a hug and that's 
I mean, people even say like sometimes eating that chocolate cake, it feels like a hug. No, it's so true. And I think, you know, that is what you just described. You know, a child says something to an elder about a struggle and the the elder, the parent, the caregiver says, let's go get an ice cream or why don't you go have a donut? And and what does the kid know? I mean, the child doesn't know that there are other ways to handle this. So the child begins to pair soothing and comfort with food. And it's so common, you know, that caregivers do that. There's another thing I talk about in the book that's very common is that um, my mother always did this. Parents try to solve and fix too quickly and they don't address your emotions. So you come home and you say, I didn't get picked for the team. You know, again, I didn't get picked for the team. And you're having all kinds of emotions. You're sad, you're frustrated, you're angry, you're hurt. And so instead of your mother saying, I am so sorry, beginning to regulate your nervous system with comfort and soothing phrases, I'm so sorry to hear that you didn't get picked. I know how upset you must be feeling. What What are you feeling, right? Just let the child have a moment, help the child explore what he or she is feeling. And then rather than problem solve, so let's say the parent doesn't do that. So the kid comes home and says, I didn't get picked for the team. And then the parent says, um, let's go have an ice cream. And you know what? I'm sure there are other teams you can get on or there are other sports you can you can participate in. So now the parent has engaged in problem solving, right? You, I'm sure there's something else you can do and is going to take you for food, but hasn't taught you any skills for how to address the storm that's going on inside of you, right? So what I teach in this book is that we need to go inside and and take some time to explore our emotions. Emotions and the way they present in the body is bodily sensations are like precious street signs. They're precious signals from within pointing us in the direction of our needs. So we're gonna have so much more information Let's say that child doesn't get picked for the team for a second time. Well, we really, as a parent, want to understand why is my child not getting picked for the team, right? So maybe if the child shares, you know, I'm really frustrated and I'm really sad, you know, whenever they're um, rushing up for the team, you know, I don't know how to rush as fast as the other kids. And so I don't get in line quick enough or, you know, there's maybe something going on that where the child perhaps is missing a skill that the parent is going to completely miss out on because the parent didn't take the time to let the child talk about the feelings and then maybe, um, you know, and, and build it up, maybe understand what is this really all about? What is going on for my child? Um, and maybe the child has some issues that are showing uh, that it would be good for the parent to know about. So when we, quickly jump to solutions when we take our kid you know to eat some go go get something to eat or we give our child something to eat and we don't explore their inner world we are really doing them a disservice we're not teaching them the skill of turning inward we are not teaching them how to regulate emotional arousal and calm themselves down so they're going to be missing skills and they're going to end up if if they turn to food they're going to end up showing up in my office down the Mm -hmm. road well and it it, we're probably if if we're talking about us being parents to to children we're probably lacking in those skills or the parents are lacking in those skills otherwise they would be using those skills and teaching those to to their children no it's so true i mean i you know as i became a therapist over the years i really began to take a look at my mother's skills And it was so clear to me that my mother does not have any skills for addressing her emotions. She doesn't really even know what emotions are, Um, doesn't explore them. You know, if you if you say you're feeling anything, she tells you not to feel it and she tries to fix you very quickly. And and as I was building the skills over time myself, I really began to see how my parents were completely missing them. And I was not going to be able to learn those skills or develop them um, by turning to my my parents and but the you know what the the great news is is that if you're motivated you know if you want to resolve your emotional eating or any of your wayward behaviors 
the good news is, is that by learning and practicing these skills and developing a kind, soothing, inner supportive voice, you can really put an end to any of the behaviors that are really bothering you, not only the wayward behaviors like overeating or overspending or gambling, but also for struggling with, many people struggle with activating themselves. They can't get themselves to do the things that they want to do. And so that's where this voice also comes in. We need a very kind, loving voice. That's the voice of the inner nurturer to be able to morph into what I call the inner limit setter. Okay. That's the voice that's going to say, um, you had one slice of cheesecake. That's enough. The, there's, there'll be more cheesecake in the world. So, you know, <laughs> another day. Really? Are you sure? <laughs> we had enough. <laughs> we can have it again, but we need to stop today. Now, that's also the voice. And this is what I mean about activating yourself. That's the voice that when that very young part of you says, I don't want to get up and get out of bed and go for go exercise. I don't feel like it. I'm too tired. I didn't get enough sleep. I don't feel like it. I'm not in the mood. I'm kind of hungry. And that voice says, Thank you for sharing, sweetheart. I really get it. And let's get the shoes on and get going. We need to get going now. You're going to feel much better after you do it. Let's go now. Right? So that voice, that inner nurturing voice, is also our inner limit setter and our inner activator. Right? And we need that voice uh, to be very well developed. So it is kind of, it is essentially the voice of a really emotionally stable parent who has all of those skills. Yes, an emotionally stable, well-balanced, well-regulated parent. And what we're talking about really is the skill of self-regulation. And self-regulation actually is, there, there are circuits in the brain, the top of the brain, the cortex, there's circuitry called the self-regulation circuitry. And that circuitry, when we're young, with that external attunement, that prop, that nourishing, nurturing attunement from mommy or daddy or grandma, that connects the fibers of the self-regulation circuitry to the emotional brain. That's the part of you that says, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't care. I don't feel like it. So when we get proper external attunement when you're, we're young, those integrative circuits form between those two parts of the brain and we're actually able to access a regulatory voice in our head that says get going now right so you kind of wonder I started my book by saying have you ever wondered how it is that some people can have their favorite foods in the house they can have cheesecake in the house and they can have ice cream and they can have cookies and scones and all their favorite stuff And they go and they get, you know, a little serving size and that's it. They're done and they don't go back, right? Why is it some people can do that and other people can't have any of that in the house or they're binging their brains out, right? Now, of course, there are many factors. It's not just one factor. Food addiction plays a role. Some people do have food addiction and some people don't. But more importantly, the ones that are able to have their favorite foods around, the ones that are able to activate themselves to exercise regularly, the ones who are able to get those books written, the ones that are able to get everything done, put it all together, those people are able to access the self-regulation circuitry of their brain and regulate their behaviors fairly easily. And Don't we all really want to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about that this morning, Julie, because uh, I was thinking about all these success gurus and they're like, if you want to be successful, you got to do this and this and this. But for some people, if we don't have, I mean, it's like that's for, for someone who doesn't have emotional attunement and isn't able to regulate themselves and isn't able to activate themselves, like you, you said, that's like starting at 12th grade calculus we don't have the skills we don't have the basic multiplication and and division skills to even handle that level of work no it's true and that's why I, I do coaching and I do psychotherapy and that's why some people are not 
really coaching clients, right? Because they're not coachable yet, if you will. They really have some deeper challenges going on, let's say just activating themselves or knowing how to soothe and comfort themselves or knowing how to regulate their nervous system. These are very basic skills. If you don't have these skills, you're not going to probably be able to move on to these more advanced uh, or or more complex functioning where you're really, you know, on top of everything and taking care of any, everything. And that's why, just like you said, I've always thought, you know, all these coaching gurus and everything, it's kind of like the Nike ad, you know, like just do it. But that really misses the point as to what's missing and what's really holding people back. And I've always written my books and wanted to write about uh, these kind of deeper places, these deeper issues that, if you will, that are are really what hold us back. And and the good news is that always that these are all just skills. They're all just skills you can learn. If you can practice a skill, you can get there, right? It's just like, and I always liken it to playing the guitar. You know, when you start to play the guitar and you have to put your fingers on the frets, on the notes, strum and everything feels awkward and weird and you don't like it much and you know you don't really feel like practicing because it's always awkward and you wonder will it ever flow and you know other people are it's flowing but you're not there yet if you practice 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 you start to see oh gosh now my fingers just go there like they just know a c chord and a g chord and they just move without me even really thinking about it then it begins to be more enjoyable. That's how all of these skills are. At first, it's kind of like you have to, the first skill in the book is called pop the hood, where you have to kind of get quiet with yourself and really begin in in any situation, let's say where you want to grab your favorite comfort food, is to pop the hood and find out what am I actually feeling in this moment? What's What emotions and, and what bodily sensations am I having in this moment? And you begin the process just the act of doing that begins the process of regulating your nervous system and you are mu- it is much easier to make better food choices when your nervous system is regulated. So just getting in the habit of popping the hood and saying, okay, I really want to go get a bag of chips and I said that I wasn't going to eat chips. Let me just stop and pause for 10 minutes. I talk in the book about a 10-minute pause. Let me just pause let me tell myself I can always have the chips. You know, they're not uh, going out of style and there there isn't going to be a shortage of them anytime soon. I can always go get the chips. Let me stop, pop the hood and find out what am I feeling, right? Just this very act can stop the whole process. It might not, um, but this is really critical that we that we develop skills and they're all skills that any any of your listeners can develop anytime at any age i have people you'll see even on the book people that write to me and they say you know i'm 77 years old and i have never had these skills and this is the first time that i'm hearing about them and learning them and you know i i work with people from you know 15 years old all the way up to 85 learning the skills Thanks, Julie. We're speaking right now with Julie M. Simon. She's the author of When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain, and End Emotional Eating. Julie's website is overeatingrecovery.com. So Julie, you mentioned this this 10-minute pause. And it sounds like because we if we're going to change our brains, if we're going to change our habits, we have to do something differently. So I, I can imagine that that there's that fear of, well, if I'm not allowed to have the chips that I'm craving, then that's going to cause a lot of distress. But it sounds like you're saying even just start out practicing, okay, so I'm going to delay this gratification for 10 minutes and see how I feel in 10 minutes. And even then, at least, at least then I've, I've built up one new skill. Right. But you have to have more skill than just pausing for the 10 minutes because if pausing for the 10 minutes, maybe pausing for the 10 minutes will work and you won't grab the food, okay? But but 
you don't want to just stop with oftentimes, you know, people will come to me, they'll work with me, they'll learn some of the skills and then they'll just work on setting limits, kind of like a diet type approach. Like they'll say, I'm doing really good with my food. You know, I'm just setting limits and I'm just saying, you know, I can have one slice of this, but no more. And, And I'll say, that's great. I'm glad that you're able to access that limit setting voice, but that's not going to be enough to get you where you need to go because um, you're going to have times where you need a lot of soothing and comfort and nurturance and support times when you need to give yourself hope and hold faith, all of that stuff. And so you're going to need to build that nurturing, kind, supportive voice. And the only way you build that, you don't build that if you're just setting limits all the time. That setting limits is great, and that's part of the that inner nurturer voice. As I said before, the inner nurturer has to morph into your inner limit setter. But we need to, I would prefer that people build the kind, warm, compassionate, validating, soothing, loving, helpful, and hopeful voice first over t- that that voice will become a limit setter but <clears throat> all of us need to have a voice inside our head that is kind compassionate always compassionate always self affirming unconditionally loving unconditionally accepting unconditional that really means without conditions so that doesn't mean i love myself as long as i've lost five pounds but when i gain 20 i hate myself right unconditional so we need to build this voice and practice self-validation self-compassion unconditional self-acceptance bulges um, cellulite double chin acne and all a kind loving voice that says I love you just the way you are I love you just as you are I accept you with all of your flaws Um, even when you make mistakes I love you you don't have to be perfect for me to love you I'm here with you every second I'm closer than your breath I am your ever supporter this has to be developed in every single person Hmm. So can we take a moment, Julie, to to pick that apart a little deeper? Because I feel like, so I if I eat the chips, my intention was to not eat the chips. I'm using some, some self-validation and some self-compassion. And then I'm going to love myself even if I eat the chips or even if I gain the 20 pounds. Can we talk a little bit about the difference between still loving myself even when I've done this behavior that I'm trying to change how is that different from the one who says, oh, it's okay, we'll go through the drive through and start our diet tomorrow? Right, I know what you're saying. So, so we have this fear, we all have this fear that if we accept ourselves, if we're unconditionally supportive and loving and forgiving, that we'll sit on the couch all day and eat bonbons, mm-hmm. right? Or we'll go through the drive through and we'll put a big giant moo-moo on <laughs> and, we'll never, <laughs> and we'll never take the weight off, okay? That's what our fear is, is that if we're, that we think that kindness means indulgence, that compassion means a giving in to doing anything that we want. And that's not true because building this voice, remember I said this voice is also a limit setter. This voice is not a voice that says, eat as much as you want of the cake and don't ever worry about health or weight consequences. That's not the voice we're building. We're building a voice that says, it's okay to want uh, some ice cream and it's okay to have some ice cream but we have limits we work with limits we regulate right so we're not building a voice that is going to encourage us to do unhealthy things we're not trying to build a voice that says sure go to the drive through any day of the week. You know, that's what you want. That's okay to do. That's not what we're trying to build is a a inner indulgent voice or a voice that uh, isn't limit setting or self-regulating. We're trying to build a voice that's loving and firm, that's able to set gentle and loving, effective limits, right? So this voice, this, this part of us has a lot of jobs, 
the inner nurturer has many jobs. She has to she help us identify and name and track our emotions and bodily sensations. She helps us identify what our true, authentic, non-food needs are. She validates our emotions and bodily sensations. She helps us look at our thoughts and helps us decide if they're self-defeating, negative, or critical. She helps us hold hope. She reminds us of our strengths and resources. She helps us set limits, gentle, effective limits. And she helps us meet our needs. So she's got a lot of jobs. She has to be nurturing, kind, supportive, and firm, right? So remember I said before, she's the one when, when that young party who says, I don't want to get up and go for a run. I don't feel like it. She says, I, she's nurturing. She says, I really understand that. You are tired. We didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I can understand you not being in the mood. Now, here she comes in. She's not indulgent. She says, but we need to get the shoes on now. Right. So she's kind. She's loving. She hears it. She validates. I, she's validating. You're tired. I understand you're tired. And you know what? We can still have a good a, a good run. We'll, we'll do. Maybe she accommodates. She says, all right, we are tired. So today, why don't we just run for 20 minutes instead of 40? Right. But she doesn't let you off the hook. Hmm. And I imagine, I mean, that's going to for someone who doesn't have that skill, that's going to take time to build up. It's going to take time to build up. But if you walk through the skills, the seven skills that I teach in the book, as you're, as you're starting, I was, when I was doing this during my own emotional eating recovery days, I was piecing together all these skills that I had been missing. And it's almost like there's a critical mass. You know, you work on them. It's just like what I said before, playing the guitar, learning a new language, learning to, I'm learning Spanish in my car right now. <laughs> and so when you start, it's just so awkward and uncomfortable and, you know, you don't, some of it's fun sometimes, not always, right? But if you kind of stick with it, and this is what I was noticing when I was building skills during my emotional eating days, that all of a sudden that voice was developing. And I only found out years later when the neuroscience came out that I had actually rewired my brain. I didn't really know that that's what I was doing. Um, but all of a sudden, a voice was starting to develop. I've been, I have been practicing reframing my thoughts with a more kind, compassionate voice and validating myself and trying to be more positive in my thinking. And so when you reframe your thoughts in a positive, kind, self-compassionate way, that actually is the voice of the inner nurture that you're using, whether you call it that or not. And so I was doing that. I was catching and reframing my self-defeating thoughts and working on holding more hopeful thoughts and working on validating myself. So I was, without knowing it, I was working, building the voice of the inner nurture. But was, what was so incredible was that at one point, at some point, it, it like took hold and it was there, like a presence, almost like, um, like a, an angel watching over me. It was there. There was a voice all of a sudden. And I remember so, so specifically that one day I was laying in bed and I heard the voice say, I love you, Julie. I love you and I'll always take care of you. And I was like, whoa, where did that come from? You know, I sound like a new age frou-frou. <laughs> <laughs> but it was my own voice. I had developed something inside of me that was going to be there with me and for me forever. And it was delicious and incredible and beautiful and that comes from practicing the skills i would wish that for everyone you know that if you practice enough you will build something inside you know we live in bodies and bodies can always have stuff happen and bodies change and bodies age and bodies die and so we're going to need something throughout all those changes and all those possible things that can happen. We need something on the inside that's ever present and always able to comfort us through everything, right? Like you could, you could have be married and you have your partner and you say, Oh, I feel safe because I have my partner. But what happens when you're on that plane and that plane crashes and your partner isn't on the plane and you're alone by yourself you need something inside yourself that says to you, we're going to be okay. And even if we leave this body, we're going to be okay, right? You need a, a comforter mm -hmm. inside. 
Oh, I could cry. I just feel like so, so few of us have that. And, and if we practice these skills, we can, we can develop it. Yes, completely. Mm. And you must, you must, if, well, you don't have to, but if you don't develop that, then you live in this world kind of like you're a leaf on the ocean, you know, kind of being blown around and, and life is much more challenging without an inner supportive voice. Thank you, Julie. I, I just want to quickly um, go over the seven skills because we keep mentioning them. Um, so skill one is what you mentioned, popping the hood, which is to name and track emotions and bodily sensations. Uh, skill two is practice self-validation. Skill three is reinforce the alliance and offer love, support, and comfort. So what do you mean by reinforce the alliance? So in skill number one or two, I teach you to start using that inner nurturing voice and, you know, maybe kind of separate out the young part of you, the feeling part of you, which I call the feeling self and the, and that adult part of you, the inner nurture. So we, we start right away working on developing that voice, even when we pop the hood. So maybe that voice says, what are you feeling right now? You, you've come, come away from work and you're driving to the drive through and and that voice says, let's stop for a second and pop the hood. I'm wondering what you're feeling right now because you're wanting to buy a cheesy burger and fries and a shake. Um, what are you feeling? What emotions? What bodily sensations? Then we go to skill number two where we're practicing self-validation. So that voice, we're, we're still working on strengthening that voice and learning skill while we strengthen the voice. Um, it makes sense that you're upset at what your coworker said, you know, it wasn't a very nice thing that she said, of course, you're feeling hurt. Of course, you're feeling angry. It makes sense that you're having some tension in your shoulders and your neck feels tight. Right. So now we're using that voice and we're validating in step number in skill number three, we're reinforcing the alliance. So we start by reminding and reassuring. That's one of the steps under reinforcing the alliance, we remind and reassure the feeling self that you're here. So I'm in the parking lot at the drive through thinking about the cheesy burger. And my inner nurture says, I just want to let you know I'm here with you. You're not alone. I know you had a really bad day. I know you're scared. I know you're worried. I know you're hurt. I know you're angry. I know you're frustrated. I know your heart is racing. I know your, fi your fists feel tight. I get it. I really get it. I'm here with you. I'm right here with you going through this. We remind and reassure that young part of ourselves that we're not alone in this. There is something very grand. And for the, anybody on a spiritual path, you can kind of connect that also to your spirituality, to your angels or God or your source or your higher self or whatever you call that. Um, that in that skill reinforce the alliance. It's the alliance between the youngest part of you that's scared, worried, hurt, angry, wants to eat a cheeseburger, and that nourishing, comforting part of you. So we remind and reassure, and then we offer comfort and soothing. This step, this part of this skill, number three, is so important because all of us need to learn what is exactly soothing and comforting for me, right? Uh, is it soothing for someone to give me hope? Is it comforting for someone to tell me I didn't do anything wrong? Is it comforting for someone to tell me that it's okay to feel whatever I feel? We need to figure out. And this is why when you said earlier, you know, that coaches sometimes say, just do it and you can do it. The, all these pieces of moving ourselves forward have to be worked through. So when I'm in distress, came away from work and I had a rough day, what do I, Julie, or what do I, Marie, find comforting and soothing? You want to figure that out and know it and learn it and have it in your arsenal. What is comforting and soothing? And then so we, the inner nurture offers the comfort and soothing and also offers the third step of the third skill is love and support. I love you. I care about you. We will get through this together. We'll take it one day at a time. I know sometimes for me when I'm under stress or like earlier today, Marie, when you're having tech <laughs> problems or when I'm having tech problems and I start to get super frustrated, my inner nurture swoops in and she says, it's okay, sweetie, we're going to figure it out. And if we can't figure it out, we'll find somebody who can help us. 
but we'll get through it. These things happen. You know, it, you can't, you can't control everything. We'll figure it out. We'll get the answers, right? So she swoops in and comforts and soothes me. Um, third part, like I said, is offering love. I love you. I care about you. I'm here with you. We'll get through this together. So that's the third skill. The fourth skill so we're not really ready. If you see, if you look at the skills, the first skill, we pop the hood, we find out what we're feeling. The second skill, we start validating what we're feeling. That starts to calm down our nervous system and help comfort us. The third skill is we swoop in the inner nurture and she adds love and support. She reminds us she's here. She comforts and soothes us. Now we're, we're still in the, drive, the parking lot of the drive-through. Now we're feeling more calm. We're feeling more calm and a little bit more centered. Now we can address our needs. So we don't try to figure out our needs, which is we have to put our thinking cap on and we have to go to the cortex of the brain and we're, we have to move out of the emotional brain into the thinking brain. We're not ready to do that when we're, when we're super emotional. So first we move through the emotions, we regulate our nervous system, and now we're ready to address our actual authentic non-food needs. So that's skill number three is identify your needs. So you're in the parking lot and you say, you know what, I'm not really hungry actually. You know, it's not really even my dinner time and I'm not actually really hungry. What is it that I need? I guess I need comfort. I guess I need more soothing. I guess I need reassurance that I'm not going to lose my job. I guess I need reassurance that I could find another job if I don't have this one. I guess I need um, confidence in my own skills. Now we're realizing what we need and what we need is not food. And by the way, most emotional eaters, when I'm working with them in my 12-week program or privately, have trouble sometimes identifying their emotions. M many emotional eaters don't even know what their bodily sensations are, that their chest is pounding or their head hurts um, because they're disconnected from themselves and they're going numb. Many, many emotional eaters tell me I have the faintest idea what I need. I just don't know what I need. You know, they might say, I need a new job. And I say, okay, maybe that's down the line. But in this moment, what are you needing? And I'll say, I don't know. And I'll say, do you think maybe comfort? Oh, yeah, comfort. That's what I'm needing. Do you think maybe reassurance? Yes, yes, reassurance. So they don't even know what their own needs are. How can you move forward if you don't know what your needs are? That's skill number four. Skill number five. Now, once you've identified your needs, you may find that you now have a new set of emotions flaring up and a whole bunch of self-defeating thoughts. So you identify the need. I need more purpose and meaning in my life, and I'm not getting it from my job. I need more purpose and meaning. Now you're flooded with self-defeating thoughts. How in God's name am I going to do that at 52 years old? Right? Like, how am I going to solve that? I'm not good at blah, blah, blah. Now all now come all the self-doubts and self-defeating thoughts. All right. So you can see as we're going through these skills that there's so many minefields. There's so many <laughs> places to trip yourself up, right, where, where we get tripped up. So now the self-doubts start coming in and then the the deep, deeply entrenched and negative, uh, critical self-defeating thoughts. So skill number five is where I teach you how to catch and reframe those kind of thoughts. And it's not about just stating affirmations, all is well in God's garden and my life is beautiful, you know, because for most people that, that especially if they're not on a spiritual track, you know, that doesn't do it for them. We need, need to learn how to catch and reframe our self-defeating thoughts. Skill number six, maybe you're, you've done your, your reframing, catching and reframing of self-defeating thoughts, but you notice, ah, there's still so many doubts creeping in. Can I really, could I really do this? Would I really be able to change, blah, blah, blah. Skill number six, we learn how to highlight our strengths and our resources. So we really flood ourselves even more now, reminding ourselves of every one of us has a multitude of strengths and a multitude of internal and external resources at our disposal. So skill number six is we're going to flood ourselves. We're going to highlight our strengths and resources because that feels good. 
and that energizes us and that regulates our nervous system even further. And it gives us hope. And part of skill number six is learning how to practice hope and practice optimism. And I give skills, uh, you know, teach you how to do that. And the very last skill, so after we've done all this emotional regulation and we've looked at our thoughts and we've highlighted our resources and our strengths, now we're ready to meet our needs. Now we're ready to put the thinking cap on and do some problem solving. And we're also ready for setting gentle limits. This is why I always say to people, you cannot set limits on your eating. You can't just you want to, you want to say, I've decided I'm only having, you know, sugar uh, treats and desserts one time a week. And, and you can't get, you can't do that. Why can't you stick with that? Because you're not ready for limit setting. You have to go through the skills of being your own best friend and being there for yourself all the time and building the self-regulation circuits of your brain. And then you will be ready to set effective limits with yourself everywhere in your life on everything, every behavior that you think is wayward, and you'll be able to activate yourself to do the things you want to do. So the seven skills take you through all of that, and it takes time to work on them. And most people who work with me, you know, will learn the skills, and then we hone them, and we hone them, and we hone them, and they take my 12-week program, and they stay with me for follow-up groups, and we, we dig deeper, and we, you know, dive further, and it takes time. It's not a quick fix. Inner nurturing is not a quick fix, but it is a forever fix. Beautifully said, Julie. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left in the show. And so the book, the name of the book is When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain and End Emotional Eating. So it sounds like getting that understanding of all of these skills is is in the book. And it's it's so it's it's a great book. There's lots of uh, exercises and, and prompts to look at all of your resources and to journal and all of that. But it sounds like the 12 week course that you offer uh, through your website overeatingrecovery.com is a way to break it down and, and as a group, everyone's moving through and practicing the building of these skills. Yes. And what's great about the 12 week program is we work with the other book as well. So overeating is a, is a complex behavior. And it really requires a multidimensional approach. So these skills are the emotional piece of it. In the 12-week program, we also address body balancing principles. We talk about nutrition. We talk about eating when we're hungry, stopping when we're full. We talk about hormonal imbalances, food allergies, food addiction, brain chemistry imbalances, which I touch on in the, in the second book. Uh, we talk about what and how much exercise do we really need to be doing. We talk about... Um, ways of regulating metabolism, uh, like intermittent fasting and things like that. We talk about getting restorative sleep. And then there's a whole set of what I call soul care practices, learning to quiet our minds. So we cover all of that and we cover what, what we cover in this book in the 12 week program. And in the, and you get lectures every week from me and every week you get a live coaching call with yours truly. So I don't farm out what I do to anybody. I do it all myself because um, I think it really takes working with an expert and someone who's been down that road, you know, to really uh, dive in there and help you, you know, do the same and figure out where your unique challenges are. Beautifully said, Julie. Well, I it seems like we're out of time. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Um, and the book, again, When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain, and End Emotional Eating. It's a beautiful book. Uh, we all need that inner nurturing voice. Uh, and I think that the, the more that we can develop that voice, the better our lives are going to be and the better the world is going to be. So it's really important uh, from whatever source you, you're going to get this information to really work on on being compassionate with ourselves, being able to set loving limits and nurturing ourselves. Yes, that's what the book is all about, inner nurturing. 
Beautiful. And again, so if you want to get in touch with Julie, her website is overeatingrecovery.com. And that 12 week program is offered a few times throughout the year. Uh, But when's the next one starting? We're starting at the end of April. End of April 2018. Thank you to Julie. And thank you for being with us this hour. I want to send you lots of love and inner nurturing. Be well. Namaste.